And for any composable arrows, composition is associative. Okay. So arrow here. Let's see. So arrows in a lot of categories will be set to erotic construction. So for instance, category of sets, arrows are just functions. The category of groups, arrows are just group homomorphisms. Um, and so it is sometimes the case that these arrows have um, like a close tie to set theory or like are just set theoretic constructions. But I think what's importantly different about category theory is that they're not, these arrows aren't always restricted to this kind of set theoretic construction. So to kind of make this clear, I want to talk about a couple examples. So one example um, is the example of groups. So I've already kind of used groups as an example of naive structure because you have this underlying set and you can build this binary operation on top of it and you get a group, given that it satisfies certain conditions. Um, but you can also get a group from a category. So I'm going to go into more detail, but kind of like in short, um, any one object category that has invertible morphisms or invertible arrows will actually just be a group. And the way that that works is um, if we start with a group, so just for like sake of clarification, we're just going to start with a group G, and we can reconstruct this group as a category. So to do that, we say, um, usually denoted BG, which is uh, the group as a category. So the object is just G. So this G like suggests that it's a set, and that's like an important thing. Like it actually isn't important. Another like way of denoting this is just saying, sorry, say or, just saying star, because it really doesn't matter that this is a set. We just need one object in our category. That's what's important. Our arrows are then just given by the elements of. And composition is given by the binary operation of the group. Okay. Um, so basically, what this is saying is that we can replace all of these set theoretic notions with the category theoretic ones. So instead of taking the elements to be elements, we can say that they're arrows of this category. Um, and instead of taking the binary operation, we can just get that from the composition of the category. And so we're really just replacing all of these um, set theoretic elements of the group with these category theoretic ones. Um, and like I said before, so like we started with this group and reconstructed it, which is why we have like reference to set theoretic things. Um, but any one object category that has um, who's like, every arrow is invertible, um, will give you a group like this. So you can just get it without starting with a group for reference. Um, okay, so again, these arrows, the elements of G, aren't set theoretic constructions. They're just elements. They're not functions. They're just, um, like if you said an element G of G up here, in the category, it would just be a map, or an arrow, sorry. Um, G from the one object of the category to one object of the category. Um, and the composition relation will make sure that um, all of the axioms of a group are satisfied. The composition together with, sorry, associativity and the identity condition on categories. Um, okay. So again, the arrows here aren't set theoretic. Another way of thinking about this distinction is to think of um, the example of Poe sets. So it's also the case that any partially ordered set will give you a category. Um, to do this, you just interpret the elements of the set as the object of your category, and for every, sorry, and your arrows are given by if A is less than or equal to B, I'm oh, sorry, a is less than or equal to B, you can only have A arrow B. Should have written in the other order, but so your arrows are just coming from the relation of your partially ordered set. 
And so again, this isn't a set theoretic construction, this arrow here. It's just corresponding to the relation that we get from the partially ordered set. Um, and so it seems like, or it is the fact that these arrows are just a more general, um, or a generalization of the set theoretic functions that we're usually talking about. Um, okay, so this is what I think is distinct about category theory and where it's, um, like abstract structure is coming from. The fact that these arrows aren't limited to set theoretic constructions. Okay. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that gives you a taste of what sophisticated structure is. And as I talk about the rest of the examples throughout the talk, it should become more clear because we'll just see more instances of where these come up and how they're distinct from um, the kind of like usual way of thinking about things. Okay. So let's see. So now I kind of I want to jump into talking about the generalizations and analogies that we get from category theory. Um, so I'm going to spend most of the time talking about generalizations, um, just because I want to make sure that I have enough time to unpack at least one of them, and then depending on how much time I have after talking about generalizations, I'll also touch on um, analogies a little bit. Um, okay, so I think there's two important ways that generalizations come up in category theory. Um, first, we get general constructions, and second, we get general theorems, kind of like corresponding to those constructions, but general theorems of which there's important mathematical results that are just corollaries of these theorems. And so I'm hoping, well, so I will give you a couple examples of each of these phenomena. Okay. Um, so perhaps the most important way that we're able to get general constructions from category theory is through universal properties. Universal properties are a way of defining mathematical constructions um, it's, it's an impredicative way of defining them, where basically you just have a diagram and the object being defined is the object that will make the diagram commute um, universally. Okay, so again, that's kind of vague and probably difficult to wrap your head around without an example. So I have an example on your handout for you. And the example I want to talk about is the categorical product. So. Um, the categorical product is the generalization of the, or it corresponds to the notion of like Cartesian product. Um, so we're all familiar with the Cartesian product of sets, and we're familiar with the fact that in the context of groups, you can take the Cartesian product of groups just by taking the Cartesian product of sets and then choosing the appropriate binary operation. Um, I guess like keeping the same binary operations for groups. And like similarly, for like topological spaces, you can take the product of spaces by taking the Cartesian product of the underlying sets and then choosing the product topology. Um, so it's already kind of familiar that we're able to, in some sense, generalize this notion of Cartesian product to other categories or to other contexts. Sorry, um, but this notion of categorical product gives us a much cleaner way of doing this. Um, so let me just state the definition first. All right, so if we start with any category C, it should be noted, so not every category has products, but a category that does have products, let's assume we start with that category C, then um, the object P with projection arrows, P1 um, and P2 from P to A and P to B, where A and B are just any arbitrary objects in the category. Um, so this object T with its arrows is the product of the objects A and B. If given any pair of arrows um, X into A and X into B, where X is again an arbitrary object in the category, there exists a unique morphism or arrow U from X to P that makes the diagram mute. Um, so yeah, so in the category of sets, this project is product is just going to turn out to be the Cartesian product of two sets in the category of groups. It's going to turn out to be the Cartesian product of groups. 
um, with the natural binary operations, and like similarly with topological spaces and most other standard categories. So, um, already this is nice because it gives us one definition that captures all these different instances, the instance of sets, groups, topological spaces, but it does even more than that because it applies in categories that aren't, that don't have objects that are these set theoretic constructions that we're used to. So for instance, you can build a category corresponding to a proof system that, um, such that the product of that category is just conjunction. So, so the details aren't too important, but this category is just, it takes objects, sorry, let me like be clear. So if we fix the formal language L, then we can form this category by taking the objects to be the equivalence classes of the well-formed formulas under interderivability, inter and then the arrows will just correspond to derivability. Um, so maybe let me just write that out for extra clarity. So if we take, um, yeah. so we fix our language L, and we can take equivalence classes of well-formed formulas that are just going to be, uh, sorry. Where alpha is related to beta if and only if beta is derivable from alpha and alpha is derivable from beta. Okay. So these are the objects of our category, and then the arrows are just given by. I'll use this. Well, alpha arrow beta if and only if beta is derivable from alpha. So this gives us um, a category that corresponds to the proof system and to a proof system. Um, and moreover, uh, in this category, the product is just going to be conjunction. So we take alpha data. So for any local formulas, alpha and beta, or sorry, equivalence classes, um, the product is going to be the object of the category that makes sure that this commutes for any choice of phi up here. So basically, well, I'm going to interpret this a bit more later um, with one of the examples I'll talk about. So I'll leave it at that for now. Um, but what's important for now is that the product just is conjunction in this case. And this is interesting because it tells us that there's a significant structural similarity between the conjunction and um, the Cartesian product of sets. This is interesting because we can take um, examples like uh, this theorem of propositional logic says that that says that the conjunction of alpha and beta implies gamma if and only if alpha implies parentheses beta implies gamma. So this is interesting because this, this theorem actually is true for the same reasons that the set of functions from uh, A cross B into C is isomorphic to the set of functions from A to uh, make sure I right here. Okay. So because conjunction and Cartesian product are playing the same role, they're both playing the role of categorical product in their respective contexts. Um, these two Theorems are like true for the same reason. So it requires more than just the product. Let me say something about that first. So the product here, these are both instances of the categorical product. And then this here and this, um, this like exponential, ex exponentiated set. So this is just the set of functions from B to C. 
Um, these both are what's called the exponential object in the respective categories. So that's just another universal property. It has like a diagram somewhat similar to this. Um, and so this whole theorem is just true because of the relationship between the categorical product and the exponential object. So they're both true for exactly the same reason, and namely because the exponential object and the categorical product have um, this relationship called an adjunction at the category, at the level of categories. And so this is something that we wouldn't be aware of without category theory or without having this level of abstractness to talk about these uh, structural relations. But it's also kind of interesting because um, it's something that was kind of noticed that there was some kind of similarity going on between conjunction and Cartesian product and that in particular these two statements were kind of related. Um, and so with category theory we're able to give a more concrete explanation of how these are related and why they're related. Okay, um, kind of along those lines, this example in particular shed some light on an observation that Genson made. So Genson um, was interested in the relationship between introduction and elimination rules for natural deduction. Um, and he said something about how, uh, I put the quote there, I'll just read it better than my paraphrase. Um, so he says, the introductions or the introduction rules represent, as it were, the definitions of the symbols concerned, the connectives, and the elimination rules are no more in the final analysis than the consequences of these definitions. Uh, this fact may be expressed as follows. In eliminating a symbol, we are dealing only in the sense afforded it by the introduction of that symbol. Okay. So, elimination and introduction rules actually just come from these universal properties. So for instance, the elimination and introduction rules for conjunction are just coming from this diagram. So, um, so this down here, the bottom part of the diagram is giving us an elimination rule. It's saying that if we have alpha and beta, then we can derive beta from it and we can derive alpha from it. And the introduction rule is just coming from this top part. So the introduction rule says that if we have a proof from phi to alpha and a proof from phi to beta, then we also have a proof from phi to the conjunction alpha and beta. And so this relationship between the introduction and elimination rules that Genson noticed is really just coming from the fact that they're following out of this category theoretic structure. And like we have similar structures for disjunction and um, implication. So disjunction, kind of unsurprisingly, just corresponds to the dual of this diagram. It's called the co-product. And implication corresponds to the exponentiation or the exponential object that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so all of these introduction elimination rules can be traced back to this category theoretic structure, which is something that obviously Genson didn't have access to, but which helps us explain what Genson was noticing, or the phenomena that Genson was pointing out. Um, okay. So yeah, so, so both this Genson example and the example of these, the relationship between these theorems demonstrate how category theory is able to explain particular instances of things by, um, by appeal to its like general theorems. And um, the universal properties that I've mentioned, like product and exponentiation, are instances of the general constructions that we get from category theory. So, so I want to say that these are explanatory because they're just kind of revealing um, the similar structure that's underlying this phenomena that seems to be common. Um, across much of mathematics. Um, and I think it's particularly striking with instances of like Genson's observation, because it seems like he just, did, just didn't have access to this kind of uh, structure, and so wasn't able to um, like quite put his finger on what was happening between these introduction and elimination rules. 
And so category theory kind of just provides like a nice answer to this question, like why is introduction related to elimination in this way um, that we otherwise don't quite have access to. Okay. So let's see. I'm going to talk a little bit about analogies now. Um, okay. So analogies, um, the example I think I put on your handout was the example of algebraic invariance in geometry and topology. So this is, again, kind of returning back to why I first got interested in category theory and its um, <coughs> philosophical significance. Um, so, so like algebraic invariants are, of course, very important to areas like algebraic topology and algebraic geometry. Um, a like good chunk uh, of work in algebraic topology is dedicated to the study of algebraic invariants, like homotopy and homology. And a lot of um, the power we get from these algebraic invariants comes from the fact that they are just category theoretic structures. So, for instance, um, the fundamental group is just a functor that maps from the um, category of pointed topological spaces to the category of groups. And uh, this functor, which, sorry, I didn't introduce, so like a functor is just a mapping between categories that preserves structure. Um, yeah, that preserves the structure of the categories. Um, so to have a functor from the category of pointed topological spaces to the category of groups is to say that we have a mapping that takes our pointed topological spaces to groups while preserving certain kinds of structure. And so this is why it's valuable in algebraic topology, because we're able to translate or transfer top of the homotopic properties of topological spaces to talk of groups, which often is like much simpler and kind of zeroes in on the properties that we're interested in, in the case of homotopy, uh, without, uh, without like kind of having the whole topological space there. Uh, yeah, so it kind of, it's better to say it just zeroes in on the properties that we care about most uh, when we're studying homotopy. So, so this seems to provide a kind of analogy because it's saying, look, we can reason about the structure of these topological spaces in this algebraic context, in the context of group theory. Um, and, and so I want to say this is explanatory because it changes our the context of our discussion in a setting that's like kind of more familiar to us. So, um, in the case of the fundamental group, we're able to uh, compute things about homotopic properties more easily in the uh, setting of groups. And I think that um, that the reason we're able to do this is partly because it's zeroing in just on the properties that we care about, and partly because um, we're just using more familiar group theoretic methods. And so, whereas uh, in this case, these analogies aren't really unifying in the same way as the generalizations were, I think they're introducing a different kind of explanation uh, by um, by just like increasing our familiarity with the discussion. So this is something that's perhaps uh, a little bit, still remains a little bit vague in my project, but. Um, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm gonna interrupt her just yeah. once to ask, are you familiar with the the project of model categories in homotopy theory? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's uh, a, so, so that's a direction to go with what you're, you're talking about. That we create new categories by, that relate to old ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So it's been a while since I've looked at model categories, so that's something I should look at into in the future, but I'm not prepared to be on it today. Um, but yeah, so, uh, thank you. Uh, 
sorry. But yeah, so the idea though is that, uh, yeah, sorry. So I want to say that the ability to formally translate talk of one area of mathematics to another, like translating talk of topological spaces to groups, is allowing us to um, to kind of like increase our familiarity of that discussion. Um, so another example that's kind of perhaps a better example of analogy um, is the stone duality theorem for Boolean algebra. So um, this theorem, which says that Boolean algebras are dual to stone spaces, is um, is like just boils down to an equivalence of categories. So it's just the case that the category of Boolean algebras is equivalent. Um, to the dual category of stone spaces. And so this, of course, um, stone duality was around before uh, categories, but again, in this instance, we're kind of seeing that it's the category theoretic structure that underlies these constructions or these areas of mathematics that explains why they stand in the relations that they do. So it's because these two um, these two kind of like mathematical structures stand in this category theoretic relation that we have stone duality. Um, okay. Um, sorry, I had a quote in my notes. I was trying to decide if I don't want to read it. Yeah, so again, I mean, so, um, the stone duality theorem is just like very important because it allows us to uh, switch back and forth between talking stone spaces and Boolean algebras, and in some cases it's more illuminating to talk about stone spaces, and in some cases it's more illuminating to talk about Boolean algebras. And so this has always been like a very important result in mathematics, but what's significant about the category theory is that it's explaining in a more general way, how it is that this relation stands, or like why it is that this relation stands. Um, and so I think we get some explanatory gain just from looking at um, this relationship on a category theoretic level. Because we know things about categorical equivalence um, that can help provide some insight or some clarity into this relationship between Boolean algebras and stone spaces. Okay. Um, so those are some two of the instances of analogies I wanted to talk about. Um, so let me now say a little bit more about the explanatoriness of generalization and um, analogy. So I didn't quite explicitly mention this, I don't think, when I was talking about the generalizations. But the general constructions that we get from category theory turn out to be unifying because they unify Cartesian product, conjunction, um, Cartesian product as it like shows up um, in different contexts of mathematics, like with groups and topological spaces. Um, and then we also get um, unification from the generalizations in the form of general theorems of category theory. So. Um, <coughs> Again, like with this example, we get like a more clear unification of these two results. Even though before, like before the uh, category theoretic discussion of the two results, we still kind of were aware that there was some kind of relation going on here. When we introduce the category theory, it becomes clear what that relation is, and it really unifies them. They really just are the same theorem in different contexts. Um, okay, and then analogies on the other hand. Um, proved to be explanatory again because I think they increase our mathematical familiarity. So, kind of with the case of stone spaces and Boolean algebras, it's useful to be able to translate between the two. In the case of algebraic invariants, like the fundamental group, it's useful to be able to translate our discussion of one area of mathematics to another. Um, and moreover, more than just being useful, I think that it turns out to be 
explanatory because when we translate, we are just zeroing in on the properties that we care about um, in the specific context. And so we're able to um, kind of more clearly see what's going on just with the homotopy. So if we're looking at homotopy groups, um, looking at them as groups allows, them, allows us to just focus on homotopy um, and more clearly see how they stand in relations to other things. So perhaps like it's worth mentioning um, like how many algebraic results play a huge role in these algebraic invariants. So for instance, uh, exact sequences become such an important role in, category, in algebraic topology because once you translate to the talk of homotopy groups or homology groups, you're able to study these structures purely algebraically. So you're able to look at exact sequences and the algebraic structure between them and draw conclusions about the homotopic, pro homotopic properties um, at the topological level. Um, and so I think I have to figure out a little bit more how to say, how to connect that to ex explanation. But the um, general idea that I want to put out there is that there's some kind of familiarity that's being increased when we translate in this way. And doing that um, is some kind of mathematical explanation, or at least has some kind of explanatory value. Okay, so then, in summary, I guess talking ended up being a little bit shorter than I had originally planned. Um, don't know exactly how that happened, but uh, in summary, what I hoped to point out was just um, that there is a unique structure, or a structure unique to category theory, one that isn't um, restricted to set theoretic constructions, and rather one that can be viewed as a generalization of these set theoretic constructions. Um, <coughs> And it's the structure that allows us an abstract perspective that highlights relations of different areas of mathematics that otherwise are obscured. Um, so yeah, and so in this way, in the sense that we're unobscuring relations of mathematics, category theory has allowed us to gain explanations of different relationships between mathematics and new explanations of already existing or already known relations of mathematical, uh, different areas of mathematics and mathematical objects. Um, so yeah, so perhaps it'd be good to open up for discussion and I'd like to hear your feedback and I can also clarify on anything that perhaps was a bit unclear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah.